So welcome uh, to another edition of the Political Institutions and Political Economy Workshop at the Bedrosian Center at the University of Southern California. Uh, I'm Jeff Jenkins. I run the, the Pipe Workshop. I'm a faculty member uh, in the Price School here at USC. And today we have Mark Weidenmeyer, who is a professor of finance in the Ardra School of Business and Economics at Chapman University. Before arriving at Chapman, Mark was faculty in the economics department at Claremont McKenna College for nearly two decades. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a BA in economics and history from the College of William & Mary. His research focuses on macroeconomics, monetary policy, and economic history. During his career, he's published in top econ journals like the Journal of Political Economy, the American Economic Review, and the Quarterly Journal of Economics. He currently serves on the editorial boards of the journals Explorations in Economic History and Cleometrica. Mark and I go way back. We were both at the University of Illinois in the mid-1990s. Uh, Mark was in econ, I was in political science. We both took the Austin's two graduate seminars in economic history, which were really seminars in historical political economy in retrospect. And we ended up writing a paper together on the Bank of the United States that was published in the journal Public Choice. And Mark reminds me today that that was his first publication. I'm always happy to have a chance to interact with Mark and today I'm pleased to have him give a pipe workshop. His paper today uh, is co-authored with Gustavo Cortez and Brian Taylor and it's entitled Financial Factors and the Propagation of the Great Depression. And if people have any questions either uh, during the, the the talk or afterwards, just uh, type it into the chat box and I'll, I'll decide what to do with it. So over to Mark. All right. So thanks for the introduction, Jeff. It's great. It's been uh, a really long time since I've talked to you. It's our first discussion probably in 10, maybe 12 years. Okay. The title of uh, my talk today is uh, Financial Factors in the Propagation of the Great Depression. This is uh, work co-authored with uh, Gustavo Cortes. He's uh, at the University of Florida. He's an uh, Illinois alum as well. Uh, Brian Taylor, Global Financial Data, and um, I'm at Chapman University and the NBER. So what is this paper all about? So this paper is um, kind of starts from Bernanke, the 1983 AER paper. And what Bernanke argued was that the monetary channel that is associated with uh, Friedman and Schwartz, the idea that a big decline in the money supply can explain uh, the Great Depression led to the large uh, economic downturn. He argues it's insufficient to, to uh, explain the Great Depression and that there ha has to be another, another factor. And what he argues is, is it's, it's the credit channel. And Bernanke talks about, he's written a lot about bank failures and its consequences for the real economy. Firms during the Great Depression couldn't get credit to undertake profitable business opportunities. Banks also feared bank runs. So if you feel, feel bank, fear bank runs, then banks are going to contract their loan supply. And that's what, that's what Bernanke's argued in several papers. And banking problems, since firms couldn't get credit to undertake uh, profitable business opportunities, that reduced economic activity. You also have to keep in mind that firms' demands for loans may have also declined with, econ uh, declined with the uh, Great Depression as well. So most of the credit channel research uh, has focused on coincidence and or lagging economic indicators. So couple well-known papers by Anare Kalari and, and Joe Mason. They have a paper in the JMCB where they argue that uh, they use failed bank uh, deposits as a measure of bank distress and they find that it has a significant impact on uh, economic activity. Calamiris and Mason in the AR, they actually have three AR papers which are kind of related to this. This one, the 2004, is about the consequences of bank distress they um, relied predominantly on uh, coincident lagging economic indicators such as credit aggregates or failed bank deposits. So what's the contribution of this paper? Well, the contribution of this paper is that we're going to say, look, why don't we consider financial factors 
as a better measure of the credit channel during the Great Depression. Bank stocks are a forward-looking indicator of the health of the banking system, and there's really not a comprehensive systematic study of bank stocks. Now you do have, there's like four or five papers where bank stocks appear about the Great Depression, but they tend to be limited sample sizes. And they tend to focus like, for instance, in Calamaris and Wilson, their journal business paper, it's, it's a New York City focused. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce a new bank stock index. And we're gonna, going to first establish like basic stylized facts about the performance of bank stocks. For example, how much did bank stocks go up in the 1920s? How much did they go down in the 1930s? And how does that compare to other sectors in the, on the, the, the list of, that traded on the New York Stock Exchange? So we'll do that. We'll also talk about uh, the market capitalization of bank stocks and how, and how that evolved over, over the 19 and 20s and 30s. Number three, point number three, we're gonna augment a standard credit channel VAR with the, banks, with the bank stocks. And so what we're going to show is that the bank stock index predicts the onset of the Great Depression, which in a number of studies has, uh, it's, it's been said that the Great Depression is not uh, forecastable. And it explains nearly one third of the forecast error variance in industrial production after five years. And then finally, we'll, we will follow up the standard VAR analysis with a regional micro level analysis of 12 Federal Reserve districts. So we have uh, bank stock indices for the, for the Federal Reserve districts. And so we're going to see, we're gonna test different transmission mechanisms um, in, as to what the bank equity index is at, uh, indices are actually, uh, pre what they're actually, uh, what, what they're actually, why are they actually going down? All right, so we're gonna start off our roadmap of how we're gonna head uh, forward. We're going to uh, start off with a little bit of banking history. We'll talk about some data. And then we're gonna establish some stylized facts about bank stocks during the 1920s and 30s. We'll have some aggregate evidence with uh, VAR analysis. We'll then uh, take that down to the micro level or regional analysis for the sort of to identify the sources of the transmission mechanism. And then we'll have some conclusions. All right, some banking histories. The, the uh, 1920s were a go-go period for banks. Banks and trusts dramatically expanded their businesses after World War I. And one of the big things that uh, happened during the 1920s is the electrification of the United States. And financial intermediaries financed this electrification. We also had a lot of other forms of technological innovation, which we'll talk about a little later. But the financial intermediaries, the banks, financed this. The U.S. economy between 1920 and 1929 grew at an average annual rate of 3.7%. And also the uh, services of banks expanded at this time. In 1918, uh, national banks were given fiduciary powers uh, to, which allowed them to compete directly with uh, trust companies. And so what you see in the 1920s is banks, especially New York and Chicago banks, would get a um, investment banking wing on top of their commercial bank. Um, in 1927, uh, the McFadden Act um, was passed, and it basically dealt with three issues in the banking system. It granted the Federal Reserve Banks and National Banks perpetual char charters. It expanded branch banking for national banks, and it encouraged mergers and acquisitions and for banks to expand their, ge their uh, geographic, uh, geographical footprint. The economic expansion ended in uh, 1929 with the onset of the Great Depression. In October, we have the stock market crash. Now, initially, the uh, recession was considered not very deep. It was considered the term Friedman and Schwartz used in their classic monetary history of the United States. They referred to it as a garden variety recession. The uh, garden variety recession turned into a depression following the onset of a series of, depending on who you talk to, three to four different banking crises. The first one was in November 1930, which was a collapse of Caldwell & Company, which was a large bank holding company in Tennessee. 
That was followed up in uh, December of 1930 with the collapse of the Bank of the United States. Now, what's interesting about these crises is that at least the first few, many, some people have argued that they were regional. They didn't imp impact the New York money market at all. And that the crisis, the, the, certainly the first one, and many people argue the second and third, were also regional in nature. The second major banking crisis took place in, uh, in Chicago and, and uh, Cleveland Federal Reserve districts. Chicago experienced many, many, many bank failures. And the reason Chicago experienced many bank failures is Chicago at the time had a lot of unit banks that financed uh, the growth of the suburbs in uh, Chicago. And again, Wicker um, in his well-known book on uh, the banking crises of the uh, Great Depression argued that this crisis was just limited to the Chicago and Cleveland Federal Reserve districts and that it was regional. The third major banking crisis is about, uh, is actually even more, uh, comes from an international source. That's in October and um, in 31, the gold drain, there was a gold drain in the US when England announced that uh, they were going to abandon the gold standard. And it led to a gold drain in the US. Now the gold drain was largely confined to Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia, at least according to Wicker. Now, the fourth major banking crisis is the one that a lot of people know, know a lot about. It started at the end of 1932 and lasted until March of 1933. It's, and it's associated with the inauguration of Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, of Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, Roosevelt came in, was inaugurated in March of 33, and he immediately declared a bank holiday. And several states had basically declared bank holidays before this. And uh, it was largely considered a, a major uh, banking crisis, which led to significant uh, changes in government regulation. So the banking crises of 1933 led to the passage of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1933. Uh, the Glass-Steagall Act is arguably the most important piece of financial legislation in the 20th century. It created deposit insurance through the founding of the FDIC. It also required member banks of the Federal Reserve System to join the FDIC. And it also called for the mandatory separation of commercial and investment banking services. So what's interesting about that is, is that the, the idea of should commercial and investment banking uh, services be allowed to exist or not, that's an argument that's still going on today. Um, in 1999, we had the Graham Bleach uh, Biley Graham uh, Act, which basically undid a lot of uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, but, uh, and some people attributed that for a reason, or at least part of a reason for why we got the 2008 financial crisis. Because once again, we, we didn't have the separation of commercial and investment banking services. Okay, so bank stocks. Where are we with bank stocks? Well, this is kind of interesting. So the bank stocks traded over the counter. So they're not included in CRISP. So CRISP is the standard database that finance and economic professors go to, to, to look at stock prices for firms. It begins in December, 1925. But since the banking sector either traded OTC or on the regional stock exchanges, there's very few uh, financial intermediaries or quasi financial intermediaries that traded on the big board in the 1920s and 1930s. So what you have to do is go to the Commercial and Financial Chronicle, which is a publication at the time. And this publication um, reports bank, uh, bank stock prices. And so we've uh, collected, well, let's say Brian Taylor collected a lot of this data and uh, we sort of then put it in order and, and, and created some, some data indices with it. And one of the things we were interested in was, you know, you hear Bernanke and all these papers written um, in, in written about the so-called credit channel, and they talk about how important banking was. Well, one way to measure the importance of the banking sector is to find out, relative to let's say other sixteen other sectors, how does bank how big was banking in 1929? Well, as it turns out. In 1929, the banking sector was accounted for almost 20% of America's stock market capitalization. 
Okay, so that's a new fact. Now, after the crash, after the crash and stuff, it, it's like twelve to thirteen percent for most of the most of the nineteen thirties. But fact number one is that the banking system was had a had the largest market, uh, largest sector capitalization. If you apply that to Fama French uh, seventeen, so the bank stocks traded OTC as I, I admitted. Uh, I, Discussed earlier, the bank stocks are not included in the S&P 500 either. And, uh, you know, this took a long time to do this. I'd wanted to do this for years, but I just didn't have the resources to do it. So uh, Brian was uh, generous enough to do this. So what I have here is I have uh, bull market run up from 1920 to uh, 1929, basically. And, the point here is just how do banks perform relative to everybody else? So banks are the third best performer during the bull market of the 20s. Utilities are number one. That goes on with the electrification and machinery, large scale enterprises. If we look at the bull market decline, banks are it's like an 87% decline. So here's mine is 90. So there's like a 90, uh, almost a 90% decline in bank stocks. And you can see that steel, highly cyclical industries like steel, automobiles, durables, right? I mean, when you have a bad recession or a depression, what's the first thing you stop doing? You don't buy cars and you don't buy uh, microwaves or refrigerators, although they didn't have microwaves back then. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is look a little bit on the time series data. And so what we have is everything here is, in, is pretty much in log form, uh, except for the ratio of failed bank deposits. But what I have here is I have our data sample for the aggregate data goes from 1920 to 1939. And uh, what we have is, is we have the S&P 500 composite index, we have a bank stock index, industrial production, wholesale prices, uh, M1, and the ratio, okay, and then we have this, uh, the ratio of failed bank deposits to total bank deposits. Now, what I have here is you might wonder, well, what are these little dark periods here? What are these dark periods? Well, these dark periods denote recessions as reported by the NBER. So you can see that the Great Depression is here, started at uh, the end of August, 1929. And it's there till uh, March of 1933. And then you have the 37 and 38 recession, which is often called the recession within the depression. And so we, we highlight those to show you, as you can see, there's large drops in pretty much everything, um, except for ratio of failed bank deposits, they're gonna go up when there's bad times. But most of, a, most of the series go down as you would expect. All right, so what we're going to do next is we're going to use a, a, a simple uh, standard Cholesky vector autoregression that you could even learn in an undergraduate uh, time series class. And uh, what we did here was is we wanted to say, okay, we're going to use bank stocks as the financial factor. And we're going to do that first, and then we're going to use the S&P 500. Because you might think, well, it's actually the S&P 90 at this time, but you might think that the S&P 500 would do a better job of predicting economic activity. So economic activity in our model is LIP, it's a log of industrial production. We also include uh, the, the money supply and wholesale prices and the failed stock of deposits. So the failed stock, oops, the failed stock of deposits is what's typically used that's probably has been a very popular measure of credit of bank distress is the failed stock of deposits. Now that's also a lag, at best a coincident, if not a lagging indicator. And so what we do is, is we have these variables. We give bank stocks the first ordering followed by industrial production, prices, money, and failed stock. And what you see is, is that bank stocks this shows you if you shock bank stocks, what happens to industrial production. So if bank stocks go up, industrial production goes up a lot. Okay. Now, if you have more failed banks, failed stock of deposits, that should lower industrial production. And we see that as well. If the money supply increases, 
Okay, that should also benefit in the short run under the assumption of fixed prices. That should also benefit economic activity. Okay, and higher prices can be beneficial for the firms as well. So what we can do now is do what's called a forecast error variance decomposition. And we can see that the bank stocks, and we do this for six, 12, 24, 36, 48, and 60 months. We can see that bank stocks originally explained 26% of the forecast error variance in industrial production. And at the end of the sample, after five years, it's explaining 54% of the, of the movements in industrial production. That's a lot. Okay. As you look here, once you include the bank stocks, the failed, the failed stock of deposits really goes down. Okay. So in Mason's paper, and we use the same lag length as he does, he finds this variable is like 30 or 40 percent. Once you include bank stocks, it, it, it goes down for close to zero. And M1, uh, M2, and the money measure here is also a measure of credit. Okay, so the other story you might believe is that, you know, bank stocks don't predict economic activity, you know, because S&P 500 might be better, right? Because you're, you're basically aggregating the information over 90 firms, okay? With the bank stocks, the argument that banks might be better is that banks have some information that other people in the economy don't have, right? Banks, bank, people who are associated with banks, they know who to lend to and who not to. They have better information about, you know, who do you lend to and who do you not? The other argument is, is that, well, maybe it's better to have the S&P 500. The S&P 500, okay, contains the information on a lot of, a, a large set of firms, large firms in the U.S. economy. So we did that, and you get similar results to what you, you got with just the bank stocks. And if you look at the forecast error variance decomposition, you can see that earlier on, and this is a finding that we find that's pretty robust, is that the S&P in the early stages, six to 12 months, explains more the forecast error variance of industrial production than the bank stocks do. Okay, we'll get one, one, one quick question, Mark. What, how, what percentage of banks just went away in the first couple of years, just disappeared? Well, there's like 7,000 banks that, that uh, most of the banks that failed were small. Okay. okay, so there's like, there's different numbers out there. There's a lot of different numbers, but one number that shows up a lot is 7,000. Now, so if you look at the top end banks, like the New York banks, the New York banks don't fail. The Bank of the United States did. But in general, the, US, the, the big banks in New York didn't fail. So do you think the banks got better at figuring out who to lend to over time? Were they just taking on riskier, riskier prospects early on? Well, that's certainly possible because they're financing things like electrification, um, which, you know, that stuff, when things go poorly, um, you know, it's going to take a bigger hit on your balance sheet. But the other issue is, is that the, the New York banks and let's say the Chicago banks are also much larger, right? So they have a more diversified portfolio. So they can, you know, if you're, if you're a bigger bank, you tend to weather, um, if you're a bigger bank and you're a bank that's been around longer, you tend to weather the storm better than small unit banks. Okay. So the places that get hit really hard tend to be, you know, the bank in the small one unit, you know, the one, the bank with one office in Ames, Iowa. <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of those. <laughs> but there are some large banks that fail, but in general, in general the, the large banks do much better. And they also, there's a lot of mergers in the 1930s, as you'd expect, right? You see that any time there's a, there's a financial crisis in the United States, you know, the Federal Reserve, you know, gets, comes, in, comes in and says, oh, you know, let's arrange a merger so we, you know, so we can help the banks out. So a lot of that went on. And, um, but the balance sheets of, the, of a lot of the large banks still looked in the 1930s, didn't look all that great. But they survived a lot. In general, they're, they're survivor, they do, they do much better in terms of surviving. So what we're going to do next is, is we're going to uh, say, okay, we're going to put both the bank stocks and the S&P in the same regression. Right? So that makes sense, right? If you want to run a horse race, so what we're going to do here is we're going to run a horse race. Our bank stocks 
or the S&P 500 better at predicting economic activity? So how, what we do how, first- How correlated are they? Do you know? Uh, they're pretty, it's like 40, it's, I said like four, it's in the 40s, I think. Hmm. But just see, the results are interesting, okay? So, so there's some correlation, but they're not, it's, it's not, it's not perfect. There, there's differences. Um, and you'll see it through the analysis because the, the S&P doesn't predict the depression at all, whereas the bank stocks do. Um, the s and is better later on in the depression. So if you look at the bank stocks, okay, we order them first. So that gives them priority in the, that gives them priority in the, in the um, variance decomp, that gives them priority in the analysis. So if you do this, okay, and you put bank stocks have the first ordering. So when you put bank stocks have the first ordering, that means bank stocks have a contemporaneous effect on all the other variables in the system. By putting S&P giving it the second ordering in the VAR, the S&P 500 does not have a uh, contemporaneous effect on the bank stock, but it has a contemporaneous effect on all these other ones, on IP, WPA. So what you find is, is that early on, the S&P does a little better, but at the end of the day, after five years, which is a sort of a standard forecast horizon used in VARs, the bank stock index can explain 30 0.65% of the movements in industrial production. Whereas the S&P 500 can only explain 14.78. So what are we gonna do next? Well, we're gonna flip it. We're gonna put the S&P 500 first and the bank stock second. All right, and so the failed, the failed stocks just doesn't do anything. I, I haven't mentioned that, but that's the standard measure. That's the standard measure that's been in the literature. So if you put the banks, uh, the S&P has the first ordering in this. Look at this, this is what's so interesting. Even if you reverse the ordering after five years, the bank stock index explains twice as much of the movements in industrial production as the S&P 500. Okay, so that's a key result. Now the other factor that I had, didn't talk about is, is when you put the bank stocks first, and the S&P second, you actually get a negative effect. You get the opposite effect predicted by the theory. So for a large, for a large segment of these time horizons. So right here, this is saying that if you increase stock prices, industrial production goes down. And that's not what you would expect. What that means is, is that the, the bank stock, there's, there is some collinearity there, but the bank stock's killing off the S&P 500 for this time, right in this period. Okay. All right, so this is really cool. Um, this is one of the sort of the key takeaways from our paper. And what we have here is a historical decomposition. So what is a historical decomposition? So you have a baseline projection, which is right here, this, the dotted line. And then as you can see in every graph here, we have this gray line. This gray line is industrial production. And what we want to know is, is how does each variable, how well does it predict stuff? Well, you can see that this is bank stocks. Bank stocks mimic industrial production basically over this period here. And that's leading into the Great Depression. If you look at S&P 500, it doesn't predict the Great Depression at all. But later on in 31, 32, you can see right here, this is the S&P 500 line and it's pretty good at predicting this. If you look at failed stock of the bank deposits, which is what's been, is one of the big variables used by Bernanke and co-authors, you can see that it really doesn't explain very much. And so one of the primary contributions of this paper is that there's a lot of studies arguing that the depression was unpredictable, it was unforecastable. So Peter Timmon, um, famous MIT professor, argued that it wasn't forecastable. Effie Bimelech and Carola Friedman at Northwestern have a recent paper at, in the JFE where they argue that uh, the Great Depression is not forecastable. 
And then there's a Matt Shapiro at Michigan has um, a well-known AER paper written in the late 80s that the Great Depression was, quote, an unforecastable event. I think this provides pretty strong evidence that it was forecastable. You just have to use the right variable. And it makes sense, right? If the Great Depression was largely about bank failures and banking and a banking crisis, what variable would be, what variable should predict the Great Depression the best? It should be a bank stock index. So I'm, I'm curious. So you, 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 you dismissed the idea of sending this to an econ journal, right, earlier. <laughs> let's say, let's say uh, Friedman or Shapiro got this paper to review. What would, what would they critique? What would they, what would they say? Oh, I think Matt Shapiro would like the paper. I do. But I think you don't Matt, th Matt Shapiro is a very smart guy, yeah. But you don't think this would become, this, this is not a, an econ, a top econ journal hit because it, it's, it's contra. It's finance and, factors. Yeah, it's financial factors. But it, you know, it, it, it engages with important work in earlier econ publications, right? Yeah, it does. It also engages with top finance publications. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, Bimelech, I mean, Bimelech's a very well-known finance guy. At, um, I know Effie. Um, he's at, he's at Northwestern. So, um, but anyway, so maybe we should have sent it to an econ journal. <laughs> but, you know, so um, anyway, so it's only by mid-1931 when the S&P, uh, uh, index begins to do a better job than the bank stock. So, you know, that was one of the comments when I, I talked to some people about writing this paper is that they're, they're like, oh, well, you know, the, the S&P is going to outperform your outperform the bank stock index. I said, I don't think so. But, um, but it does have uh, some more, it is better in the 31 and 32 period predicting than the bank stock. All right. So, what does our disaggregate analysis, uh, the transmission mechanisms? And uh, so, so we provide evidence that the bank stocks predict the depression, but what's the mechanism, right? I mean, so I just have this result, right? I mean, it's nice, it's kind of, kind of cool, but um, can we say more about what is it, what, what are the bank stocks picking up, right? So what you would expect is, is that the bank stocks are forward looking. So they should be picking up forward, they should be able to predict coincident indicators. So essentially what we're going to do is we're gonna look at three channels and we're going to see whether or not the bank stocks can predict these different channels. Okay, so the three channels we're gonna look at is the default forecast channel. And this is basically the idea that you have a real shock. A real shock is going to affect mortgages right? It affects the family. It's like a household finance shock. And the household, excuse me, may not be able to pay the mortgage. And so if that's true, then the bank stocks, if enough people aren't paying their mortgages and the bank stock associated with those mortgages is going to go down, right? Because the primary asset of a bank is mortgages. Okay, that was true back then. Now, another potential channel, which um, is this, what we call the new credit channel, and this is the idea about declines and bank's equity value affect their ability to raise credit in the future. So in other words, so, you know, if your bank stock's going down, okay, that's a sign like, for instance, you might be worried about, well, maybe, you know, the Great Depression's on and we may get a bank run or something, our bank stock's going down. And so what you typically find, what we, well, at least what in a well-known study by Calamiris and uh, Wilson and Calamiris and Mason is, is what a lot of banks did, their loans to bank asset ratio fell during the depression, in part because banks were worried about a run, okay? And that would, that's the same, you would expect then that the equity value kind of proxy, might proxy for that. If the equity value starts going down, the banks, you know, the banks looking at, you know, the banks probably like, oh, we need to, you know, sh make our, poor, our our credit portfolio a little bit smaller, take on a little bit risk, a little bit risk, a little less risk. Number three, the technological bus channel. You know, it's like the Great Gatsby, right? The go go 1920s. Um, new technologies all over the place, radios, electrification, and who financed this? Banks, a lot of New York banks. 
And so you might think then that a bank stock index may reflect revisions and expectations about the profitability of these new lines of businesses, as well as the, 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 the new technological innovations. Because what we're going to do is, is we're going to proxy the technological innovation with patent data from this time using uh, data from Tom Nicholas's uh, 2008 AER paper. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to apply this, this, this analysis, the disaggregated analysis, we're going to use a standard dynamic panel regression with 12 Federal Reserve districts. So we have bank stock indices for each of, each of the 12 Federal Reserve uh, uh, districts. And so here's some data. So these are the bank stock uh, indices for the 12 Fed districts. So you can see they all start at one. And then they, you know, they, they, they go boom, boom, boom. In general, there's a couple of exceptions, uh, Kansas City, but in general, they go boom, 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 and then they crash. And so these are, these are going to be used, these bank indices are going to then be used in a dynamic panel framework to see if they predict basically coincident indicators. So this okay, is so not in look your at paper, these. right? This is, so not, in this is not in the paper. This is the new stuff. Is this, is this going to be a new paper or is this going to be added to what you sent? This is what uh, the referee wanted. <laughs> well, we like it too. We think it's a good suggestion. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, the referee wanted micro level evidence. Yeah. And so that's what this is. So we've been, we've been busy collecting data for the last couple months. Okay. So, and uh, we have monthly data. So that's pretty good. We had to interpolate a couple places, but that's, that's normal for this period. Um, but anyway, so this is the bank stock price indices. And then here we have uh, data on the number of failures. Okay. And so what stands out is like New York runs the show. I mean, Chicago does to a lesser extent. Um, and let me move this over because let me put you, put this at the bottom. So you see a little bit of action in San Francisco, but really the action is, most of the action's in New York City. New York City's running the show here, and uh, we have Chicago as well. But the, the amount of business, you know, shown by the amount of failures, shown by um, the number of failures and the commercial, the liabilities of the commercial failures, it's much, much, much higher in New York than it is in other places. So that's why Friedman and Schwartz focused on New York City is because you can see so big. Chicago is also worth looking at. But, you know, Boston, Philly, and they're, 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 they're second tier. And then here's, uh, here's some more data. This is this data on, because what we're going to do is test the credit channel. We're going to look at the loan to asset ratio. And so this is just data from the 12 Federal Reserve Districts. You know, this comes out of the Federal Reserve bulletins, or it's, actually there's an aggregate publication we used. But uh, we'll be using that in the, in the analysis. And then we have patents. So the idea here is, is this, this is from Tom Nicholas. He only looks at the important patents. And then he calculates, uh, like, are the patents cited? And this is from 1974. And so if you have a new patent in 1971 and it, and it cited all these patents in the 1920s, they show up here in the graph then. Okay, so this is based on, uh, on these are important uh, patents, like chain, you know, important ch life change in patents, not every patent. Okay, so we have uh, the log of patents, and then we have patent citations, and we have weighted patents, which is just taking the citations multiplied by um, then uh, the, taking the patent, yeah, how many patents in a year, and then multiplying it times the number of patent citations. Okay, so now, and here we get to use, so, so um, usually, you know, if, if I give this paper and I have some applied micro people in the audience, they like, they cringe when they see the VAR and they're like, oh, no, 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 I don't like VARs. They, they stand for very awful regression. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard that one before? Uh, no, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> oh, you know, you can use it. Because <laughs> some political scientists use it. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to look at the three channels. Okay? Without using a very awful regression. And um, 
So we have the default forecasting channel, the new credit supply channel, the techno technological channel. So I wanna, see, I wanna see my table in front of me. So I'm gonna move it, move the people down to the bottom. So anyway, so what we have here is the big result is, is that, so basically we have the banks loaned, this is the dependent variable, failed business liabilities for the default forecasting channel. Because you might believe if bank stocks are, are going down because of, of bad mortgages and that's gonna have an impact on failed business liabilities. The bank loans to asset ratio is a measure of the new credit supply channel. And that, you know, often we see in times of distress, banks will uh, reduce their, their bank loan to asset ratio. And then our technological bust is, is cite, citation weighted patents. And then, you know, we regress this. We have a lag dependent variable not reported here. Um, and then we have the bank stock index. And so what comes out of this is that really what's driving things in our, in our uh, VAR is the, bank is, is the bank loan to asset ratio. And we also find a little bit of evidence here of the technological bus channel, but it's, 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 pretty, it's marginal. This is at the 10% level significant, significance. Here it's at the five and the 1%. So you might look at this and say, well, and we also have a bunch of controls. The macro level controls, we try to map the VAR into the, the, bond, the dynamic panel. And so what we do is, is we also have basically the same uh, controls that we have in the VAR. So we have, price, we have the price level, okay, we have failed stock of deposits, um, and, the, and, and the money supply. So we can, we try to, the idea is just kind of map the VAR into the micro level analysis. And so what do we find? Well, like I said, it looks like the new credit channel, supply channels are our big story. So you look at those numbers, you'll be like, do those mean anything? Point <laughs> zero, zero, 0.006, point zero, zero, 0.009? Well, you know, if they didn't, I wouldn't have reported this. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what we do. So. First off, what we have to do is convert these numbers into long run, what the long run coefficient, because it's a, it's a dynamic panel. So what you want to do is you're going to take this 0 0.009 and divide it by one minus the coefficient on the lagged dependent variable. And when you do that, you get a number of 2.3%. That's our long run coefficient on the bank stock index in this regression of bank loans to asset ratio. Okay, so we have this 2.3% number. So your next question is, this matter? Well, well then what you do, do next is, is you take this 0 0.009, you multiply it times the standard deviation of the, of the bank stock index, which is like 0.9. Okay, so once you do that, you get like a point, a point uh, oh 0.08 something. And then you divide it again by the one minus the lag dependent variable. And what that yields then is that there's a 20.9% reduction in lending on average by the banks in the sample. Okay. And so what that means is, is that on average banks in this period lends 46.2% of its assets. They contract lending by an average of 20.9, which means that, um, banks are only lending about 36.5% of their assets. And that's big. And so it suggests that in our, our VAR, what we're doing is, uh, what our analysis has done is essentially, we have taken, moved from having coincident and lagging indicators to forward-looking behavior. And the forward-looking behavior is capturing basically what's going on in the, uh, with, with lending by banks. Concluding my remarks, banks are a better benchmark to gauge the credit channel. Uh, for the Great Depression, our stock-based channel shows remarkable explanatory uh, power vis-a-vis -vis variables used in previous studies. And what we believe is that bank stocks, especially during the Depression, where there's all this, there's, there's you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers about bank stocks, not bank stocks, about banks and their impact on economic activity. Our belief is that bank stock indices are superior to aggregate stock market indices, as well as coincident indicators, because bank stocks have unique information about the idiosyncratic conditions of the banking system. 
as well as borrowers. And our disaggregate analysis at the 12 Federal Reserve District shows that declines in bank stocks is a robust predictor of cuts in bank lending. And so we argue that, you know, really what should go on here is that we believe, maybe this is pushing it too far, that every future study of the credit channel during the depression, of which there's hundreds and hundreds, should use bank stocks. Okay, so that's my presentation. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> so what, what part of the individual level analysis are you gonna include in the paper when you, when you revise it and send it back? The individual, well, we'll have this. The, the, the dynamic panel will be in there. So yeah, we have to do that. I don't, um, that'll be in there. It, it's nice. I like it because um, I have a really good suggestion. Um, some of my finance friends were like, oh, well, you know, we, we, knew, we, we knew that, you know, if you, if you poll a lot of finance guys, they'll tell you like, this, this should have been written 25 years ago. I mean, it's, this is like for finance, this is like, yeah, this should have been done a long time ago. It's just the reason it wasn't was because the, the cost of the data collection. I mean, we're talking six figures to collect the data. Yeah. So how much, how much is this, this particular, this finding on this, this PowerPoint slide here, how much is this driven by the New York banks? Right. Well, we actually do. We, uh, that's a great question because uh, that, that came up in our referee report as well. You know, we have to tinker around with the aggregate uh, VAR a little bit. We're going we're gonna to look at some bigger bank stock indices and see what happens. But of course, they'll all be capitalized. So it's not clear how much effect they'll have. But we actually put a dummy variable in for New York. And it's not significant in the, in the, in the, um, in the micro level regressions. That's sort of interesting. So it's no different. It's not different from the other. You know, it's, here's what I think. I mean, we have to look at this a little deeper, but okay. So if you run a simple, uh, if you regress bank stock returns for New York on, um, let's say the market index, the S and P 500, if you do it for New York banks, it's like a little bit less than one. Okay. If you do it, most of the other bank uh, districts, it's like 0.3 to 0.5. So what's going on is, is it, the point estimates higher, but when you, you know, you construct the confidence interval, they over, there's overlap. Okay. So the point estimate is higher in New York in terms, it's more volatile, right? Because they're financing, they're financing in New York. They have a couple of things are going on. They're financing a lot of these new technologies because you have to be a really big bank to finance, you know, electric utilities, right? That's one issue. The second issue is, is that the New York banks, most of them have um, investment banking wings at this time. Okay, until 33 at least. And so that, those two factors should drive up your beta. So can, but, can, can banks hold the bank stock of other banks? I think their investment banking wing could back then. I don't know. I'd have to look, but I'm pretty sure they can. They could. So, but that's a good question because that's come up. And um, some people, are, you know, some people say, well, the bank stocks in New York and Chicago to a lesser extent were growth, more like a growth stock than a bank stock because of what they're financing and because they have an investment banking wing. But there's maybe a couple banks would have betas of 1.5 or 2, but it's just not true. But the beta still is a lot higher on average, but the, 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 the confidence intervals, because you know, anytime you deal with financial data, the confidence intervals are pretty wide, right? Because the, the data moves around a lot, especially during the depression, because right, you got, the, you got the bull market and, the, and, then the, and then the bear market. So you got, you got wide confidence intervals. But uh, yeah. But no, I like it. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, uh, I think this is a saw. I think it's a good, this is a, this is a very sensible paper that should have been written 25 years ago. <laughs> we should have wrote it in graduate school. We Pretty should have. I, I, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> so back on, back on the, the you know, with the, um, when you had the, this is the appendix one, the data visualization in the paper. Oh, we're, oh here, here. Yeah. I go here. You're talking about this, right? Yeah. So the reason, okay. the reason that you don't see any, um, any upswing in the 1937 recession was because of FDIC, essentially, in the, the bottom, bottom right here, in terms of the failed deposits. Oh, yeah. So 
the FDIC had a big effect, right? The incidence of banking crisis in the United States like dramatically dropped with FDIC. Now it creates other moral hazard problems, but in terms of bank runs, it ended bank runs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most people attribute the 37, 38 recession to the doubling of reserve requirements for banks. There's an argument about this. That is a couple of people. I'm not a part of that, but that's, that's the Friedman and Schwartz uh, story. Wasn't it also in the in thirty seven that uh, you know the the federal government wasn't pumping as much money into the economy at the time? Well, yeah, I mean the the Fed was criticized as is is reducing um, the money supply by doubling reserve requirements. So at least that's the Friedman and Schwartz story. Like they should never have done that, right? Because they if you look at money, if you look here, right? So look at M one. Um, Right here, M1 really starts to skyrocket at the end of the, after March of 1933. And then you can see it, it then slows down here. And a lot of people blame the Fed, oh, Friedman and Schwartz blame the Fed once again for this, that they, that the Fed enacted a really stupid policy of uh, doubling reserve requirements. So that cuts down on bank lending. All right, does anybody have any other questions at all? I've asked a few. Oh, one of my, another one of my co-authors is one <laughs> was once uh, once in. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, this is all recorded. So we'll put this up on YouTube in about a week. So there'll be a, there'll be the full video. Cool. And they'll, they'll have a highlights video. So I'm not sure what's what what's in your highlights, but um, there'll be a highlight. So you could watch like the whole 60 minutes, or you could watch five minutes. Something like that. Oh, I could I could have my son watch it. That'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I could use it to put him to sleep. <laughs> Since we don't have any other questions, I guess we're 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 cool. We're done. Well, thanks. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah. All right, Mark. And All right. Thanks for uh, thanks for the paper and presentation.